Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with me this afternoon on this sad and somber occasion. The job that law enforcement officers do is a dangerous one, a very dangerous one. They stand in the gap between good and evil. They arrest people. They save people's lives. They keep the evil people away from the good people. They enforce the court orders. I want to introduce you to Deputy Sheriff Blaine Lane. Deputy Lane is 21 years old. He went to the police academy in September of 2020. I swore him in as a detention deputy in May of 2021. And just eight and a half months ago, in January of 2022, he was transferred to patrol as a deputy. He was a great deputy. He was eager. He was brilliant. He learned, he absorbed information like a sponge. And he was careful when he did his job. Now I want to introduce you to the antithesis of that. This is Cheryl Williams. She's 46 years of age. She's a cranker. She had a failure to appear warrant, a felony warrant for possession of methamphetamine and possession of paraphernalia. She's been to the Florida State Prison on an 11 year sentence. She served more than nine years for trafficking in methamphetamine. She was locked away a long time. She's had 11 previous felony arrests, four previous misdemeanor arrests. And once again, she failed to appear. Well, the Sheriff's Office received a Crime Stoppers tip this morning. We received this tip at about 2.07, and they said, hey, we can tell you where Cheryl is. She's at 4335 Foxtown South in Polk City. For those of you who are not familiar, Polk City is in the northern part of our county, and it is a rural area, and it's known to be peaceful and quiet. So our deputies responded there to arrest her, to take her into custody. She had the opportunity to, one, appear like she was supposed to. So obviously she had bonded out of jail. She could have turned herself in at any given time. And she didn't do that. She ran from the law. So about 224, Deputy Sheriff Holzenbeck, Deputy Sheriff Lane, Deputy Sheriff Pinnell and Sergeant Brooks went to the area to arrest her. So let me give you a synopsis of the events. And once again, as I've explained to you every time that I've done a briefing in a short period of time after a traumatic event, this is the best information we have at this point in our investigation. Every bit of this information is subject to change as the investigation goes on. But we want you to know, we want the community to know the best information we have right now. So as the four deputies approach the front door, there is two men in this mobile home We'll call the first one Witness A, and we ask where Cheryl Williams may be located, and he said she's around back. So the deputies go around back where they meet another man at the back door. And we say we have information that Cheryl Williams is there, and he said, yes, she's here. Come on in. At that point in time, Deputy Lane goes back to the front of the mobile home 
and takes up a tactical position so that he can watch windows and the front door in the event our suspect, who's already on the lam, decides to run. The position that he's taken, and this is important in a minute, is not in front of any doors or windows, but he's, he's angled so that he can see the front door, he can see a set of windows, and he's where people inside can't see him. So if the suspects wanted to attack or shoot out of the house, they can't see him. He also has the advantage that there's some old refrigerators position so that if he were to take gunfire, he could go for cover. So he is standing by while Deputy Sheriff Holzenbach, Deputy Sheriff Pinnell, and Sergeant Brooks enter. As they enter, you've got to understand this is kind of a maze. So they come upon a room, and when when they look into the room as they're clearing the house or the mobile home, they don't see anyone. So as Holzenbach is moving further so he can look more completely into this room, Cheryl Williams, this person, comes, steps into view, holding this firearm and pointing it directly at the deputies. Two deputies at this point in the investigation, we believe only two deputies fired. Sergeant Brooks and Deputy Holsenbeck. She struck at least two times and she goes down and at that same time, Deputy Lane says, I'm hit. Witness one, who is up on the front porch, sees Deputy Lane grabbing his shoulder like he's pulling at his shirt, and he walks from his tactical position out under a another covered area and goes down to one knee. Deputy Sheriff Pinnell runs to him to provide assistance to him. We believe at this point in the investigation that sh six shots were fired. We immediately transport Deputy Lane to Lakeland Regional Health the initial information that we all receive in the spur of the moment when we received our pages and the information is he shot in the arm, his vitals are good, everything's fine. We also transport Williams to the hospital because she's t shot twice. When we get to the hospital, and as they're treating Deputy Lane, we learn that the shot that went into the shoulder went into the chest cavity. And he died. Williams is currently under arrest at Lakeland Regional Health and under security. She's going to be charged with, among other charges, second-degree felony murder. So she's gone from a felony, a third-degree felony warrant for possession of meth to a second-degree felony murder charge where it's our goal to see that she's incarcerated for the rest of her natural life. So the investigation's underway. Did I tell you this gun was a BB gun? Do 
Did you hear what I said? It was a BB gun. After the fact, witness two tells us that when they heard the deputies arriving, she picked this gun up and carried it into what we'll call the gaming room. Witness two said, you shouldn't do that or you should not do that. And she said, let them in. It is my belief at this early stage of the investigation, she clearly and unequivocally wanted to put us into a gunfight with her and or a suicide by cop. She carried that gun into the room and then immediately pointed it at the deputies as soon as she saw them. As I said before, this is a dangerous job, but it's it is obvious at this stage of the investigations that one of the deputies, either Sergeant Brooks or Deputy Holzenbach, fired the fatal shot. Now I want to clear up for those questions that when they approached to go into the mobile home looking for our suspect, of course the deputies have no idea where she is in this mobile home. Deputy Lane has taken a very sound, secure cover position and he doesn't know where they are on the inside. What's the statistical probabilities that the conflict would be directly beside where he was standing? All of this breaks our heart. But in our early analysis, we find that Deputy Lane did exactly what he should have, was soundly positioned, allowed himself to have not only concealment, but cover in the event there was a shootout at the door, was clearly protected so if there was someone who jumped through or tried to shoot at him out of the door, they couldn't see him. Had he literally been standing three inches in or three inches back, the round would have missed him but he wasn't. The investigation's underway. There'll be a complete and full investigation. This is the very first investigation by our 10th Judicial Circuit Officer Involved Shooting Team, which is made up of not only the Sheriff's Office here, but Highlands County had representatives on this team. The Lakeland Police Department had representatives on the team. In fact, a Lakeland Police Detective is the lead investigator, and we have supervisors and administrators, and we're also joined by a supervisor from the Highlands County Sheriff's Office. We will release the findings of that investigation when it's complete. I can tell you that the funeral is scheduled for next week. We ask that the community keep first Deputy Lane's immediate family and then his work family in your prayers. He went out simply to serve a warrant, something we do hundreds of times a day. And this time, there were horrible, horrible, horrible ending to this. And it didn't have to happen. I want to underscore this lady who's already spent nine years in prison for trafficking in meth 
brought this. And this is the barrel they were looking down at 3 o'clock in the morning. And this is the gun that she brought to point at my deputies. She created this entire event. She forced this shooting. She knew if she pointed this gun at my deputies in the middle of the night that we wouldn't return fire or fire to keep her from killing one of our deputies. That's why she's being charged. The investigation's still underway. You can certainly bank on the fact there will be other charges in addition to that. I'll be more than happy to take questions, but quite frankly, I've told you everything that we know to release at this point in time. I have talked to the deputies shift. I will talk to the deputies that were involved in the event. They have been interviewed by our investigators working on the officer involved shooting team. I will be in communication with them just, just as soon as I can. The deputies, as you can imagine, like their family, are absolutely devastated absolutely devastated and anytime you lose a colleague and these folks depend on each other for their very life every day it is it is very difficult Sheriff, just to be clear the, the deputies were inside the mobile home and shot and hit him outside is that correct? the deputies were inside the mobile home encountered her in a room without knowing where his tactical position was. There was no way to know where they were going to intersect. He didn't know where she was. The deputies that were looking for her didn't know where she was. That's where she chose to force the confrontation. And he happened to be in his tactical position adjacent to where she pointed the gun at the deputies. The bullet came through the, the exterior wall. Can you tell us about your deputy, the person that he was? Did he have a family? Was he married? Did he have children? He has a three-year-old child. He had been on the road eight and a half months. This was his dream to be a law enforcement officer. And he was very mature in his delivery of police services for no longer than he had on the road. His friends loved him and admired him. We all did. I just swore him in just a few months ago. And this is very difficult. You know, when, when people look at this young man, he's the epitome of what American law enforcement is about. It's young men and young women that stand in the gap, that put their life on the line every day. So you see a young man. I see a colleague and that's younger than my children. This is like losing one of your kids. And outside of my wife and my sister, and my children and grandchildren, I love these folks more than anything else in the entire world. And to go there and see that, words can't adequately explain the absolute grief we feel. But it's our job to be at our very best at the very worst of times. And this is the very worst of times for us. One of my colleagues buried one of his deputies last week from a horrible event over in Pinellas County. 
So the bottom line is it, it, it's a dangerous job. When you're, when you're doing this, you, you teach and teach and coach and provide equipment and training, but sometimes despite all of everything that we teach and coach and do, and he was doing exactly like he was trained. Bad things happen. Horrible things happen. Certainly the people who ask why an arrest warrant has to be served at that hour are morons. Okay? That warrant's valid 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We received a call for service that that person was at that residence at that time. What do we do? She's running from us. She's always been running from us. She failed to appear. What do we do? Say, hey. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. We don't serve warrants at 3 o'clock in the morning. Know this. If you got a warrant outstanding, we're going to arrest you at 2, 3, 4, 5, anytime we can find you. We found this person, and we were going to arrest her. So tell those Monday morning quarterbacks to come down to HR and sign up. See if you can pass the background. See if you can pass the police academy. Let's see if you've got any intestinal fortitude to get out here and do what young men and women like Deputy Lane does. Yeah, you can sit at home and run your mouth on your social media. You don't know what you're talking about, and you certainly don't have the ability to be one of these fine young men and women. That's a good question. That's still under investigation. There's still a lot we don't know at this point in the investigation. What we do know is when they walked in the back door, we see this after the fact, we see there's a meth pipe on the bed and a Bible open to the second, uh, to Kings, Kings 2, chapter 21. I haven't had a chance to read that yet. I don't know if that is, or has anything to do with this or not. I'll read that when I get a chance. So look at that dichotomy. A meth pipe on the bed and the Bible open. Oh, and, and a light beer beside the Bible. Go figure all that. He is not the youngest deputy. He is one of the youngest deputies. You can legally be a deputy at 19 years of age. And I can tell you this, there has not been a deputy at that young age that performed at that high level. He's just professional in every sense, just remarkable. I don't know. We'll we'll make all of that available in the in the ensuing days. We heard from a friend that uh, one day he actually hoped to fill your shoes as the sheriff of Polk County. I know he's obviously very young and new to the job, but did you see potential in him for one day being? Oh, ab absolutely. This young man was game on, every minute of every day. It was his dream. He was living his dream. And certainly, he was an immensely talented deputy. Can you take us to when um, they arrived at the house? Did they have their lights on in the car? Did they announce themselves? As certainly that everyone, they talked to the two witnesses, the two men. And she recognized that, according to the one witness, she said, as she picked up the gun, and walked in, and he said, you shouldn't do that. She said, let them in. She knew exactly who they were. She knew exactly who they were. I'm convinced it's early in the investigation at this point. She wanted to force the deputies to shoot her, and we did. Unfortunately, we had a deputy 
right in the line of fire that she didn't know that but she knew she created a violent environment. The deputies didn't know that because he was tacti tactically concealed. What, um, how much meth do you have to have to have a felony? Yeah. I, I'm not sure in this particular case, any possession of meth is, is a felony. But once again, I, and I don't want to get into a lot of editorial comment today because I can spin out of control real easy, but as the media, you'd be disappointed if I didn't put my, fa my, my favorite quote in here. Some people want to call meth that low-level, nonviolent crime. Well, for all of you who are buying into that, here's your sign. There's violence all around. The use and the abuse and the sale and the trafficking of drugs. And this is one more example of how a good man died because a cranker wouldn't show up for court after she'd already been arrested and already spent nine years in state prison for trafficking in methamphetamine. Is it normal to send four deputies? It's normal for us to send backups to every call that we can get to because we know and research shows the more deputies that are there at an event, the less probability of resistance. And our goal is to take people into custody safely without resistance. When you're serving one of these warrants, is it typical to have a wide range of level of experiences? It's whoever is on duty at that time that serves the warrants. But they all have immense training and immense education before they're allowed to be deputies or law enforcement officers. So no one there was doing this for the first time or the second time or the third time. We had a supervisor on scene. We had years of experience. The deputies that responded that night were remarkable deputies with varying years of experience and we can get there but add it up it was probably a decade or two of experience we didn't have four rookies there okay all right and we've also had an a shooting in Winter Haven that the officer involved shooting team is on on the way to as well. We don't have the details for that, but among everything else, I've got that to deal with in a, in a little while. Y'all you know, be safe. We'll talk soon. Do you know which church the funeral will go be at? Not yet. We'll re release all that information. All right. Take care. God bless.